Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us. My name is Mariam Pira. I am the coordinator for The Wheel here in Chicago. I'm joined by some wonderful partners from Common Wheel Magazine, as well as our hosts at the Bernadine Center at CTU in Chicago. Very excited to welcome you all. I think this is part four of our series, and um, it's been really meaningful discussion, so I'm excited for what our speakers uh, will share with us today. Before we uh, really get going, I wanted to just sort of set some ground rules. If you wouldn't mind keeping your uh, microphones muted just while the panelists are speaking so we're not uh, getting any uh, overlap sound or, or feedback, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, and then we are going to have time for Q&A at the end of the discussion. So please stay tuned and stay uh, participating. We want to hear from you. Feel free to use the chat, ask questions. We, we want this to be an engaging uh, opportunity. So I'll start off by um, leading us in prayer for the Synod. And I'll go ahead and post this in the chat so those of you who would like can follow along. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity, so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you, who are at work in every place and time in the communion of the Father and the Son, forever and ever. Amen. And it's actually my pleasure to introduce our moderator for our discussion, Claudia Avila Cosnahan. She's the Director of Mission and Partnerships at Commonweal Magazine. And Claudia, take it away. Thank you, Miriam. And welcome again to everyone. Uh, welcome to Commonweal's The Wheel, Synod Conversation Series. Common Wheels the Wheels a community of young people and those who desire to be in dialogue with them and who seek to engage in conversations inspired by the Catholic intellectual tradition. The Catholic Church's Synod on Synodality has the potential to be the most transformative moment since Vatican II. Each conversation in our series puts in dialogue two of the Synod on Synodality's 10 themes through the experience and expertise of leaders through the nation towards a more just inclusive vision for the church. We like to thank the Chicago Theological Union St. Bernadine Center Local Wheel Community for being our host for this series. These videos are available on Common Wheel Magazine's YouTube page. Today, in our fourth out of five conversations, we will explore the Synod themes discerning and deciding and celebrating. Joining us are Amira Orozco, who is currently a campus minister at Dominican University a Catholic Hispanic serving institution where she co-coordinates the program ministry in Lo Cotidiano. She holds a master's in theological studies from Boston College and her debut publication in Commonweal as a sacred rights fellow details the work of a Chicana feminist group in bringing the church forward post Vatican II and argues that they are agents of synodality before the word was widely used. Our second guest is Natalia Imperatori Lee and she's professor and chair of religious studies in Manhattan College in the Bronx, New York, where she also coordinates the Catholic studies program. She is the author of Cuéntame, Narrative in the Ecclesial Present, and a forthcoming text in feminist theology from Paulus Press. Her work has appeared in Theological Studies and the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion. A Cuban American native of Miami, Florida, Imperatori Lee has served on the board of directors of the Catholic Theological Society of America and the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the US. She lives in the Bronx with her spouse and two sons. So we'll begin with Amira Orozco, who will share a reflection on the Synod theme, discerning and deciding. Welcome, Amira. Thank you, Claudia, so much. It's such a really like an honor to be uh, alongside Dr. Natalia Imperatori Lee. Um, and thank you for Commonweal for having us uh, tonight. So I'm going to briefly um, share some thoughts on synodality sort of overall and the implications of a synodal church, what the, what the implications might be. And then I'll go a little bit more into the specific theme that I've been asked to reflect on today, which is um, discerning and deciding. 
Um, I'll use a lot of reflections from uh, uh, experiences I've had with the Synod thus far, and hopefully what I say, we can create some, some content and some space for some good discussion um, afterward in your local communities. I'll start off by saying that I think synodality is a rather promising thing for Francis to have dedicated a large part of his pontificate to. As some of you may know, Francis began discussing synodality early on in his pontificate and the line that has been at this point used innumerable amounts of times that the journey, it's, it's all the quote in the preparatory document, the journey of synodality is the journey which God expects from the church in the third millennium was actually set in 2015, which is now uh, almost seven years ago, and it was set at the um, 50th anniversary of the Synod on, of Bishops. So in many ways, I think it makes sense that he's done this, um, and that so many uh, theologians have picked up on it as an important theme and marker for our, a church of this century. I think, though, that its sticking point for a lot of these people is that the, this redefining of synodality to include the whole people of God is actually pretty long delayed. So Francis, in a new stage of the reception of Vatican II and pulling from his own Argentine background where Teología del Pueblo de Dios, theology um, of the people of God, really took root, is not saying anything groundbreaking necessarily when he explains that the church needs to be more participatory. The preparatory document says that synodality ought to be a, quote, prophetic sign for the human family, which cannot decide on a common project. Now, without a doubt, a process that attempts to consult literally billions of people is, is, is radical in many ways, right? However, in many others, synodality, the idea that people should be involved in the processes of their local communities and that communities will get further than just, individual, uh, than just individuals alone is, is kind of old news, right? Um, synodality really is flowing from the theologies of Vatican II really concretely, and there's, there's just sort of no way to argue otherwise. And then I think a lot of scholars, including Francis himself, um, makes the argument that it goes even further back than Vatican II, right? Um, and so the truth is that there's also a lot of, because, because it's so sort of concretized in, in who we are, um, there's also a lot of examples of it in our history. And Claudia mentioned, I'll give a small plug for my article in Commonweal, um, which says that, that here in the United States, we actually have a real um, live, to me, very exciting uh, example of synodality um, in the form of the Encuentros of the 1970s and 80s, which, which were foreign by um, Hispanic peoples. So I think I say this, so, because I think as much as people want to believe it to be true, synodality is not this like foreign, foreign intervention that Pope Francis has made up or he's having this crazy fever dream where he's trying to uh, do this radical change in everything we are, right? It's really what the church is being called to and each one of us is being called to, to, uh, to be agents in synodality. Thank you, Claudia, for putting the article. Um, but I say, this, I say this all to say, to say not that to sort of reduce the stakes of synodality, but I think to increase them, right? There's an urgency that is required of the church in this moment. The preparatory document, uh, it quotes from uh, Lumen Gentium here to say that synodality is how the church can be a sacrament of salvation given this historical moment, right? So who we are as church in this historical moment requires us to be a synodal church. So which brings me directly to discerning and deciding, which is the theme that I'm more uh, specifically looking at. I have two points here based on the description put forth in the document. My hope for both of these points is that they allow each of us to ask ourselves questions about discernment in our own local contexts. So the first point is specifically on who gets to be at the table when decisions are made. The writers of the document ask this question. How do we articulate the consultative phase with the deliberative one, the process of decision making with the moment of decision taking? So I, I, think it's, I think it's a little bit of an awkward phrasing if I'm gonna be honest and I'm gonna critique the writing of it, but, <laughs> but I do think that the, the, question, the question of how do consultation and deliberation come together to be closer to one another is a really fundamental one. Who is at the table is not merely symbolic or a means of tokenizing, but it actually matters, right? So in my role as a campus minister at Dominican University, which Claudia gave a little bit of a brief introduction to, it's a Catholic uh, Hispanic serving institution in the suburbs of Chicago, where almost half of our uh, students are self-identifying as um, Latina or Hispanic. Uh, I'm carrying out the listening session together with a planning team of about five students, five to seven students. So in order, in order to prepare them to do out the outreach necessary and sort of to explain what the Synod is, um, I actually do see some of them here, but not all of them are, are, are 
watching wheels on Wednesday nights and talk about synodality, right? So some of them have lives. Um, and so I asked, I, I asked them to uh, reflect um, on the on some of the paragraphs of the synod preparatory document. And I wanted to sort of get what they were, what, what they were trying to get out of the synod, right? And what they were trying to get out of these listening sessions. On almost every line, student after student, they brought in the experiences of their mothers, grandmas, aunts, cousins, women though, who for them had meant church. Women who they watched give their lives to their local parish, who had found community in the making, tama making of tamales after mass or the Saturday night Bible group. But there was this general sentiment in the sharing that the women in their lives, despite their loyalty to the church, their church and the community, never really had any power or got any credit. The priest, male and ordained, always ended up with the credit and the decision making. So their experiences, of course, extend all the way up to the Vatican and across all levels of church, where the contributions of laity, and when we talk about laity, we have to talk about women. We have to talk about the, 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 the gender dynamic of the laity are merely in service, but not, not in decisions, right? So the naming of Sister Natalie Beckhart last year to the Undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops was, was, was quite a powerful symbol though, I think of what um, Francis is trying to do with the Synod. It's that who is at the table matters and women's absence from this table is noticeable. So the, the, the second point is more specifically on accountability which the document puts under this bullet point with the question, how and with what tools do we promote transparency and accountability? As the preparatory document itself acknowledges, the way that so many clerics have been allowed to get away with gruesome sexual crimes against minors and vulnerable people is a tragic example of a church plagued by clericalism. Just last week, Francis restructured the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith so that there is a secretary specifically dealing with these grave crimes. Naming a person designated within the body responsible for church doctrine, one of the more powerful congregations within the Roman Curia, is a show of how seriously he is taking the lack of accountability that has been exposed over the past few decades. It is interesting to note that the readers felt the word accountability so central to discerning and deciding that in the version of the document in Spanish, the word responsabilidad is used, but accountability is put next to it, right? Because there's not a word to describe accountability in Spanish, um, but they felt it so key to what they were doing here with discerning and deciding. And I only read Spanish, so I only read Spanish and English, so it might, it might be the same thing in Italian, but I couldn't be able to tell you, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, they put the word accountability in parentheses right next to it, right? So in other words, accountability, not merely responsibility or duty or obligation, but accountability is really key here. There's a reciprocity to accountability that there's not in like these other types of words like responsibility or obligation, right? Accountability gives the possibility for there to be a relationship in which one party can reprimand the other, that someone can be punished for their crime and called out for their sin. I think in this, he's saying that there's only a possibility for forgiveness if there's a possibility for accountability. For discerning and deciding to be more closely tied then accountability is not optional, but essential. I think that this is uh, probably one of the most radical parts of synodality. And frankly, I think why there's a lot, I frankly, one of the points where I think a lot of people try to resist it and especially here in the United States. For me though, it has been one of the most life-giving and affirming aspects of my experience in listening sessions with young people, LGBTQ people and their allies and Latina pastoral leaders. To encounter one another, to encounter your fellow siblings in Christ is to all of a sudden become accountable to them. To see them in their full humanity and listen to their experiences, all of a sudden you have a knowledge that makes you required to act. I saw it play out recently in a training session I did for a diocese on the East Coast where an older lady and a young man of the same parish were in my small group. As they both shared, I saw them listen to each other more intently each time. At the end, the young man shared the words, no sabia que eso era tu experiencia, señora. I didn't know that that was your experience. And she responded, yo tampoco, mijo, me neither. I don't know what the follow-up was exactly, although she promised to bake him some pan dulce uh, while they discussed what had, what, what had been talked about there. But whether or not they actually followed through with it, the point is that it was a moment where all of a sudden they became accountable to one another. So if we begin to think about this on the church level then, to become a listening church means that the church must respond to the needs of those who cry out, to react to the poor and the marginalized because the synodal church can no longer say, no sabia, or I did not know. 
And that is all I have for you all. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I will really look forward to having a conversation with Natalia. Thank you, Amira. Um, I think you've given us a lot to, to chew on at the onset of this conversation. Um, so I invite all of us to kind of sit with that as we uh, now listen to Natalia. Natalia, I invite you to share your reflection as you explore the Senate theme celebrating, which is on our prayer and our liturgy. Thank you so much. And thank you for unmuting me. I was looking for the unmute, but that's all, everything is magical with Commonweal um, and CTU. So I wanna thank Claudia and Miriam for this invitation and the welcome. I said yes, because I love chatting with all of you and I love Commonweal, but I especially love talking to Amida, who I think is um, probably the brightest of the next generation of Latinx scholars in theology. And she's really funny and it's so awesome. So um, can't say no. Um, my assignment today was to reflect on the theme of celebrating, which appears to be liturgical in focus. I'm an ecclesiologist, so you would think that I have a lot to say about the liturgy, but you'd be wrong. Nevertheless, I came up with some things uh, that I want us to think about together. When I read the, the preparatory kind of document and the, the section on celebrating specifically, I had trouble getting past the opening salvo and the assumptions therein. And here's the opening salvo, right? Uh, and I'm quoting, walking together is only possible if it is based on communal listening to the word and the celebration of the Eucharist, end of quote. Only then, <laughs> is that it? Because if that's it, in terms of walking together in solidarity, then we're gonna be in for a real problem because it's really going to limit who gets to participate in the Synod to those who have been able to attend mass of late, which I suspect means not an overwhelming majority of Catholics. So I'm gonna start with some state of the liturgy considerations, which are depressing and grumpy. And then I will move to something that I think will be slightly less uh, grouchy and hopefully more hopeful. So here are a couple of state of the liturgy considerations. First, we're nearing the end of year two of a global pandemic that has caused, as you know, rolling lockdowns all over the world, including in our own country. This has prevented people from attending mass and from receiving Eucharist, from celebrating the Triduum, from having weddings and quinces and baptisms, from gathering as a community in anything except a virtual space like the one we are in right now. The availability and quality of virtual space celebrations vary greatly depending on the resources available to each parish community, which is to say that the disparities are vast and difficult to bridge. Not everyone has a Peter Cunningham running things behind the scenes is what I'm saying. Rather than prompt us to reflect on how we can make the liturgy inclusive for all, including those with chronic illness, unvaccinated children, et cetera, we've seen bishops fail to take leadership on encouraging and demanding vaccines of their employees. We have seen a kind of laissez-faire attitude toward conspiracies about the use of fetal tissue making this vaccine somehow illicit for Roman Catholics. Prominent Catholics are on the news and in the newspapers begging for mask mandates to end even as they attend pro-life rallies. This is embarrassing an embarrassing state of the liturgy. A second front on the liturgical state of the union has been Francis's attempt to bring those who are committed to the pre-Vatican II mass into communion with the rest of the people of God. And here we have to think very seriously about whether Lex Orandi is really Lex Credendi and what sort of realization Francis came to about the Latin mass. Um, for me, I think part of it was realizing that it had gone from a grace extended to those sincerely trying to make a transition that was ushered in 60 years ago, instead having become a kind of indulgence that was creating conditions where people quite simply were just not on board with the council. Not its aesthetics, not its core belief in the priesthood of all believers, not its commitment to the full and active participation of the whole people of God. If those three things are gone, there isn't really much left of the post-Vatican II liturgy, which is, once again, the liturgy of the church. Um, 
there have been all kinds of liturgical controversies from questions about the legitimacy of indigenous representations of Mary being housed in the Vatican to questioning the use of matachines and other kinds of dancing in liturgies that are indigenous and you know proper in local communities by the very same people who refuse to accept the Second Vatican Council's reform of the liturgy. This again is not a hopeful sign if only the people who are committed to, if walking together can only happen if it is based on the mass. Vatican II called the Eucharist the summit and the source of the Christian life. Not the totality of the Christian life. We cannot reduce our Christian commitment to a Sunday obligation, nor can we reduce Christian prayer and celebration to Sunday mass, not in COVID and not ever, or really daily mass. There is more to the Christian life than its summit and its source, even though those are important. The mass is important, but it is simply not the only thing. If something ends at the source, it's just a point. The summit too, is just a point. The journey there and down are both vital. They both need resources. They both need preparation. They need a willingness to look around and celebrate every step along the journey. Do we have that willingness as a church? Are the bishops modeling that willingness? Or are we so laser focused on the summit and the source of the Christian life that it has slowly creeped into being the totality of the Christian life? That's it with the bad news. Well, the, oh, the overtly bad. Rather than focus on who's being excluded and erased and overlooked with its language of solidarity only being possible based on certain conditions, I wanna think about something that Amira started talking about, which is what does listening to those on the margins, what might that get us in terms of synod themes or questions to think about or possibilities for reform, refocus and reprioritization? Who are the people on the margins that I'd like to talk about? Latinx people and young people, um, because that's who I care about. <laughs> they have disaffiliation in common. Um, in fact, I was, I, I'm teaching Latino Catholicism this semester, and I just ran across this line in the textbook that if demographic trends continue, which is an increase in migration and counting of Latinx Americans, and a decrease or an increase in the disaffiliation of Latinx from Roman Catholicism, if those trends continue, the majority of the Roman Catholic Church will be Latino, but the majority of the Latinos will not be Catholic. This is going to be a big problem uh, for the Catholic Church. And we find ourselves continually chasing the tail end of things, um, reacting instead of reaching out in innovation. When I think about reform, this is what I mean. Reforming approaches so that we aren't planning for a future of young leadership, but embracing and empowering a present of young leadership. Where we're not planning for a future of Latinx predominance, but embracing and celebrating the actuality of it in the present. In terms of reframing as well, Framing young people and Latinos as future or future majorities, future leaders, instead of as current vital constituencies in the church is short-sighted and it hinders our ability to walk alongside and accompany these young Catholics. Um, it impedes our ability to celebrate them, to discover questions and priorities that exist in these communities. Um, as Amira was saying about that intergenerational conversation, right? We cannot see one another and recognize the experience of one another. So the Eucharist is the summit and the source of the Christian life, but what is the Christian life for these marginalized people, right? What does the Christian life look like for young people on college campuses who might be disaffected? What does it look like for Latinos who work on Sundays um, and don't have access to parishes with robust Zoom ministry? Are there extra ecclesial devotions? Um, I want us to think together about what Kaya Oaks called in her book about the disaffiliated, DIY religion for disaffiliated or marginalized folks. Some might 
bristle at the idea that there's anything DIY about Catholicism, but of course there is, and there always has been. Emphases, conscience formation, mentoring, inviting leadership that looks and acts differently from that to which we are accustomed is all part of what this is. It's all necessary for accompaniment, or the word that I prefer in Spanish is solidarización, right? Solidaritizing is, I guess, what it would be in English. Um, and I like that because it almost sounds like, like fusing yourself to the cause of another, like soldering yourself, which I kind of like. So what are young people celebrating? What should we celebrate about young people? Um, what are Latinx communities celebrating and what should we celebrate about this internally diverse community? There's a lot to be said, I think, about taking notes in terms of what it means to be internally diverse, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, and interreligious community, all of which characterizes the Latinx community in a church that attempts to be global. Can Catholics do this? Can we look at how Latinx communities mobilize for action or justice or activism and say, wow, there is a multi-ethnic, multilingual, interreligious community that can come together for something. What are Catholics coming together for, right? Do we? What for? One thing my students bristle against, and I say this, I feel like in every instance where I find myself, is this idea that, that the faith is presented in this country as a list of propositions, mostly moral ones, mostly sexual ones that are there to be either subscribed to in their entirety or um, walked away from. Sometimes this is couched in or softened as speaking the truth in love or loving the sin and hating the sinner or something like that. It's not an act of solidarity. It's far more condemnatory than celebratory. So how are we formulating an inviting image of faith? Is the way we present faith something to celebrate or is it something to be endured or something to fit or find something that fits better? Celebratory faith thinks about what's important to young people, to migrants, to marginalized groups, and centers, inviting those groups to take the lead in setting priorities and leading prayer in incorporating new practices, insights, and interpretations into the liturgical life of the church. Just as COVID has taught us that we have to make church accessible and inclusive, we can use this moment to create communities where people feel celebrated as they are, not as we would like them to be. So I'll finish um, with a little anecdote. Uh, I have a group of high school friends um, which the group chat is called Que Pasa Miami. I think we're all, you know, more or less the same. We went, many of us went to grade school together and high school. They're all Latina professionals. They're accomplished. Um, they're mostly disaffiliated from the Catholic church at this point, some emphatically so. And um, a few years ago, my kids were still little, so I had to be like a decade ago. Um, we were having a conversation about mass and one of them was like, I hate the part where it says, this was years ago, I am not worthy to receive you. I always feel so unworthy already in every interaction with the church. We just did the penitential rite a few minutes ago. Repeating this again seems like overkill, right? Like why is the church so focused on my lack of worth? And me, the dork theologian was like, that's my favorite part of the mass. It's the only honest part where we all, you know, including the priest recognize that none of us deserve any of this. And we can at least all approach with some sort of honesty saying, you know, none of us can earn this. That was completely incomprehensible to them. I was not able to see that. Whatever it was, we had failed or missed something in the messaging about women's worth or women or young people's worth in communicating the liturgy to them. What else are we missing? If the bishops want a synodal church, and the jury's out on that, what, are they willing to do away with any of the prerequisites that they have for listening? Are we? How wide a net are we willing to cast? Anyway, that's what I'm thinking about, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Natalia. Um, thank you for providing us with such important points to, to consider as we continue this conversation. Uh, I want to invite both of you now, Amira and Natalia, to, to respond to one another, perhaps share about um, what you've heard in one another's 
comments um, and maybe comment a little bit about, you know, whether you see some connections and what you've heard each other share tonight. Um, whoever would like to begin. I can begin if that's okay. Um, you, thank you for saying that I, I consider us sort of the same generation as I'll have you know. So <laughs> I wouldn't say the next generation. So I, I think you're it. the most brilliant theologian in our, in our, <laughs> in our generation. Um, but uh, there, there was a lot there. And I think one of the, one of the, obviously the overlaps that, that I'm so glad my, my students are, are big fans of you and some of them are here, right? And I think the, the caring about um, Latina young people is something that we're passionate about because we ourselves were those kids at one point, but we're also passionate about it because it's, it's who the church is, right? Um, and that if, we, if we're not honest about that, that's not, we're just not gonna get anywhere, right? And so I think that that, that was, um, and I, and I loved the fact that you started with the idea though, that, that, that mass is not where these people are gathering. Right. And I, and I see that, I see that in my, in my friendships, I see that, um, with students at Dominican university. And so I think the, the, the question becomes like, where is the place for young people in the synod? Right. If, and, and I know they had their own synod technically, but did, were any Latina youth there? Who knows? But, um, like the, the, where, where are young people, um, in the synod, and I think something that I've been trying to to push and encourage is that this synod, though, becomes a place where young people of this generation get to take get to take up our place, right? We get to take up our place in the church, just like every generation above us did, right? Because um, I think there's this there's this idea, you know, oh, our generation is the first generation ever to have any problems with the church. Like, give me a break, you know? Like that's that's absurd, right? Like. The church has been a uh, an institution, and religion has been a strife institution for for centuries, right? It's it's a it's a, um, and so I think that was that was your your framing of that um, specifically around young people. I think is is like was a very obvious overlap uh, for us. Um, and then the, the the piece that I would love if you could if we could talk about a little bit more though is that you framed in the context of COVID, which which Pope Francis himself says the synod. He, he, he planned it before COVID, he planned it before COVID, so it's a little disingenuous for him to be saying that it like just came out of COVID, but he is, but he's taking up the moment, right, to make sure that it is um, something having to do with COVID, and I will say that my pastor during COVID was Julia Erdland, who is here today, um, and she's a lay, lay young woman, right, um, and, and she was my pastor during COVID because she was my Zoom church, um, and so the, the, yeah, I'm wondering if you wanted to speak on that further or anything else that you're thinking of. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, um, I definitely think that there's a lot of overlap in what we're talking about. I think that we're both really concerned with young people because um, we see the church, you know, the, the, the portrayal of the church getting grayer and grayer and it's no offense. I mean, I have a ton of gray myself that I cover, um, but, <laughs> but we need to really kind of think about this. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, Vatican II, we like to think of it as a bunch of old people, but all the experts were really young. Mm. You know, Ronner wasn't old mm -hmm. at the council yeah. and John Courtney Murray wasn't old at the council. <laughs> you know, like even if the bishops were old, the people who were writing the documents were not. Yeah. Um, and so we've lost that sense um, of, of, young and I mean obviously there's a hundred thousand problems with the list of experts who went to the council mostly that they were all clerics yeah. um, and therefore none of us would have ever been in that situation but the synod gives us an opening right it gives us that new it almost feels like a new opening of the windows of the church or like if Vatican II cracked them then this synod or this vision of the synod church is really going to kind of throw them open mm -hmm. again or sort of grease them so that they can be opened much more easily after 60 years yeah um and and I do think that this this COVID time <laughs> has really reprioritized for me at least, or at least, or reframed this notion of the summit and the source of the Christian life. Um, it seems that once we could no longer go to Sunday mass, and I live in the Northeast, right? Where the Sunday obligation seems to be the sum total of church mm -hmm. or like of Christian identity, 
right? Everything is about, did you go to mass on Sunday? And did you get a priest to sign the thing so that your kid can show that he went to mass on Sunday? It's all framed as this kind of, you know, punch card checklist, yeah. which is such a dry and, and sterile view of the Christian life. So once that aspect of it disappeared, right? We couldn't all gather together. So many um, people like lay people, but also clerics were floundering. Oh my God, what do we do? What do we do? We, we can't say mass. What do we do? What do we do? And it's like, if we never develop anything else and we never listen to like, my family leaned very heavily into home devotion, right? Reading the scriptures together as a family before dinner on Sundays and talking about it you know, or going through the parts of the mass together as a family to practice and stuff like that, because the kids were, you know, the kids are little. Um, we're leaning into that home stuff a lot more. If we don't offer resources for that and aren't listening to people for whom that is a primary experience of church, then we're missing all of this way of developing a much richer um, Christian life that isn't just limited to the summit and the source right? There's a lot in between. Yeah. And it, go for it. I was going to ask about, like, I loved your point about mutual recognition and how that breeds accountability, mm -hmm. you know? And I wonder what sort of barriers might the synod remove to that seeing one another or hearing or, you know, finding out what is your experiencia? Yeah. Um, I think one, one thing that I'll, that I just want to say, respond back to what you were just saying too, is, is I thought that question that you asked it, that is, is so powerful. Like what are Catholics gathering for, right? If we're not gathering for the mass, there's, we're still around, right? <laughs> so what, what are we gathering for? And I think, um, I mean, we, we see it play out in the media of like what gets put into the media. Right. But, but the truth is that like church exists on much, on much, um, and, and communion, the communion that's available that you, but not that the full communion that's available at the Eucharist, but the, the communion of the people of God exists elsewhere, right outside of mass. And so um, to, to, the, to that final point that you just made, and I think uh, the, I have seen the synod, to, so, so this is very, going to be very transparent. And as I was sort of like, oh, the synod is kind of like, it's going to be this like big thing that everybody makes a big deal about, and then nothing's going to happen. I still sort of have suspicions about that. But when I have been in these listening sessions, I think that is when I have seen like, Th this is what we're talking about, right? Like this is a this is a total cultural change from what I am used to about church, right? This is this is a people are coming together and really, really witnessing each other and being um, together in ways that they've never been before, right? Um, which is 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 why I think I, I reflected on so much of like it's sort of so long delayed, right? Like where where has where has the encounter been before? Um, and, and your, your positioning of it is like the encounter specifically with the margins, right? Like that, that should have been, and is, is, is part of our Catholic faith, right? Mm -hmm. And it should have been way before um, something that the Vatican was, was pushing from a long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if the experience of the Synod, and this is something I've talked about with other groups who are organizing Synod listening sessions, if there's a kind of like stealth catechesis that's happening mm, yeah. in just in the listening sessions, mm -hmm. right? That just mm -hmm. even by inviting Catholics to hold listening sessions yeah. with, without, or despite the clergy, yeah. we are already bringing into being an experience of church that yeah. will mean people will not tolerate a kind of top-down right. church that's right. Anymore, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we'll no longer be able to plead ignorance, you know, that we don't have that's people right. who think like us or people who want the same things because we will have sat in these sessions and listened and sort of conspired together. Mm -hmm. um, and even if nothing comes of the synod, which let's face it, I mean, you know, you and I, two <laughs> under 50 Latina ladies, <laughs> we haven't been exactly socialized to expect a whole lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, from institutions. So maybe this will be, maybe that will be the change, right? The change will be Catholic sort of kind of growing into their baptismal dignity in the experience yeah. of the listening session alone. That's right. And yeah. if they never get that experience at their parish, at least they'll get it in that listening session. And that will be a kind of defining moment. Yeah. 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 So you guys have already kind of been... Uh, 
you've been exploring as you're sharing right now, really what the kind of um, requirements are of the synod, right? Um, or for us to be a synodal church. But as, as we're kind of coming to the conclusion of our conversation, although I wish we could spend more time together, um, what would you say are kind of some non-negotiable things that need to happen for us to, to move on to the next step that will increase um, our likelihood of being a synodal church? specifically in the areas that you've reflected on today and our, and our processes of how we decide things together or don't, um, and in the way in which we perceive our liturgies and how we pray together or don't. You wanna go or you want me to go? <laughs> I go. think, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you don't have a script. Uh, <laughs> The, the thing I was going to say that I think is the non-negotiable is humility. Um, mm. it's, it's the most important thing. And it, it's that moment, right? None of us is worthy. Right? It's the, the honesty to be humble and say, none of us has all of the answers to what this church needs. None of us is omniscient to um, people's suffering, either at the hands of or at the lack of involvement of the church but we can have the humility to listen to one another and to celebrate with um, one another. I think that's probably my non-negotiable for a synodal church. I, that's, that's very beautiful. And now I feel like anything I say, I'm not going to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be humble. <laughs> I'll excuse you. I, I was going to say, well, I was going to give one is like the is conversion. I think that, that we as a church are need to be converted towards something else. And, and, and um, Las Hermanas, who I wrote that article on, I think they were so good at giving this to me because I was sort of like, no, I know what the church needs. No, I do. You know what I mean? But there's, there's a conversion. There's a conversion that's required of all of us, I think, to truly listen um, even to people who we don't want to. And I think though within to be to this is going to be, I don't, I don't have a doctoral degree in theology yet. And so, but this is going to be, so it's a, it's a hot take, not a hot take, but it's a, it's a risky take, I guess. But I think women need to be ordained. Like, I think they're, we're just not going to get anywhere until the, the ordination, the people who are making our decisions is a, is a true, you can actually be called to it as a vocation, no matter what your other your other sort of uh, prerequisites are, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think getting people, you know, Sister Nazali Bequart got named to the undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops alongside a man. He was made a bishop automatically. <laughs> she was still there. And right? she was given a handshake though, so it's yeah, fine. She was, it's and we don't even know if she's voting yet. There are, they've also like not even really made it certain that she's gonna be even voting yet, right? And so um, like mm -hmm. that, that's a problem. Um, yes. so I, think, I think that, that to be, to be very honest, I think that until in decision-making and discerning, we can talk about the sort of collapsing of the two all we want, but at the end of the day, is if who is taking, who is, if who is in the hierarchy of our church is an exclusive group, it's just not going to, it's never going to work. Yeah. So I think you're hundred percent right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, um, I want to thank you both for um, the time that you spent with us and conversation. I think these common meal conversations are a risky thing for many people because we take the script away from you. <laughs> and we really want to hear authentically uh, what your thoughts are on these difficult topics of the church. So thank you so much. Um, I'd like to invite everyone who's joining us live to join us again next Thursday for our final common meal conversation around the Synod uh, through our wheel. Um, Darius Villalobos, who's the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministry, will be joining us, and Corisa Aligentera, who's a coordinator, who's a coordinator at the Archdiocese of Chicago, um, who's a pastoral minister and advocate for racial justice, will also be joining us in conversation. So now I want to invite all of us to continue this conversation, uh, and I'll provide us with some questions for reflection. So after having listened to today's conversation, what points were made that you consider to be important to the conversation around synodality? And also, what is the relationship between consultation and decision-making? And how do we put these into practice? And finally, how do prayer and liturgical celebrations inspire and guide 
or don't inspire or guide our common life and mission in our community? How do we inspire the most important decisions then? So I invite us to a moment of silence and reflection.